For our next section, we're going to be talking about vulnerability and protective factors. You may have noticed that some people are able to tolerate high levels of stress for long periods of time and seem to suffer no ill effects, whereas others of us tend to do very poorly under even low levels of stress, even for short periods of time. So let's look at these factors that might be influencing how vulnerable or resilient we are when it comes to facing stress. So the first of these factors we're going to talk about are vulnerability factors. So things that increase our vulnerability or our susceptibility to stress. Things that make us more likely to succumb to being overly stressed. So what kinds of things would make us vulnerable to stress or reduce our resistance to stress? Well, things like lacking a support network. If you don't have people to talk to and help you feel better and cope better, then you are going to be more prone to suffering more from stress. If you have poor coping skills, if you don't have the resources available to allow you to cope with or handle stressful situations, then you're going to be more vulnerable to stress. You're more susceptible to stress. And people who are pessimistic, who have a negative outlook on life, tend to also have a higher susceptibility to stress. They're a lot more vulnerable to those stressors. On the other side of the spectrum, we can look at protective factors, things that are going to protect us from stress, who are going to make us more resilient, uh, more resistant to stress, and less susceptible to experiencing stress. So things like actually having that social support, having good coping skills, and being optimistic. Those are all going to help us resist stress. They're going to protect us against stress. So if we can break down these different kinds of factors, these different um, pieces that will influence us to be vulnerable to or protected from stress, um, each of them is going to get their own slide. So let's start with this idea of social support. So Having social support is one of our more important environmental resources. So we can know that we can rely on others. We can talk to our best friend. We can go to our parents. We can communicate with other individuals and have them tell us what they think we should do. Having that support system can blunt the effect of stress, where we don't feel as stressed because we know we can talk to other people. We know that we have that support system. We know that we have that social support to rely on. Having that kind of exchange, that um, ability to rely on others and trust that they're going to be there for you can actually end up giving you a sense of identity and meaning in your life. So these are your people. And you know you can rely on them, and they've helped you in the past, and you know they will help you in the future. And this knowledge of having that identity, having that community around you, can give you more positive psychological outcomes. You are more secure, and you are less prone to experiencing stress or being bothered by the stress that you do experience. And the presence of these social support systems can help prevent some maladaptive ways of coping. So if you don't feel isolated, if you don't feel alone, you're going to be a little bit better at handling these situations. And if you have other people to talk to, maybe they can steer you away from some maladaptive ways of dealing with stress. A really interesting correlation that's been found is that people who have high levels of social support, people who have lots of people around them, lots of people supporting them, they also have higher functioning immune systems. So in a lot of studies looking at, say, cancer patients, people who are able to talk about their negative life effects, who have people to speak with, who have people who support them, end up having stronger immune responses. And this kind of makes sense because lots of studies have shown that people with these support systems end up showing a lot of disease resistance, even if they're under stress, as compared to people without support systems. So having a social support system has lots and lots of positive effects on your well-being. Um, and really cool, um, this effect, this positive aspect, seems to go both ways, where you get these benefits when you receive support, but the people who are doing the supporting, the people who are there for others, 
also end up getting some positive benefits as well. And so people who are just supporting others through stressful times can have reduced levels of stress responses in the brain when looking at brain activity, which is really, really cool. The next aspect we want to consider in terms of vulnerability and protective factors is going to be a term called hardiness. And so this was first um, discussed by Suzanne Cabasa back in the 1970s, where she started looking at company executives who worked very highly stressful jobs. And she found that some of them responded uh, to the circumstances with psychological distress and physical illness, and others continued to function pretty much normally. And she was trying to explain the difference between the group that was thriving despite the stressful circumstances and those who were being negatively impacted by those stressful conditions. And her conclusion was that there's a factor called hardiness that was influencing whether they were thriving or uh, suffering. And so she discussed the three C's or three parts of hardiness being commitment, control, and challenge. So to go through these, people who are hardy have a sense of commitment. They feel that what they do is important, that it matters. They're committed to the work that they're doing. They're committed to the people that are around them. They're committed to their families. Um, and so this belief that what they're doing matters gives them commitment and makes them hardier. People who are hardy also have this sense of control, and specifically, they perceive themselves to have control over a particular situation or outcome. So the opposite of this, if you don't feel like you have control, then maybe you would feel powerless to influence those events. So if you feel in control, it's contributing to hardiness. Where if you feel powerless, that's the opposite. So that's reducing your hardiness. And the last of our points here is challenge. Individuals who score high in hardiness will view these stressful situations as a challenge rather than a threat. So they frame the situation as a challenge to overcome as opposed to a threat to their own well-being. So by viewing it as a challenge, that also increases their hardiness. And so people have found lots of evidence for these three factors influencing hardiness and for hardiness to influence how we handle stress. People who score higher in hardiness end up having better emotional, psychological, and physical health. So of all of these, which is the strongest component? And the answer is control. That feeling of control ends up having the largest influence on how you handle stress out of these three. Now this would be a good point to, uh, or a good spot to point out that hardiness is sometimes related to and confused with something called resilience. So hardiness is referring to characteristics that help you cope with a stressful situation. Whereas resilience is going to refer to unexpectedly good recovery or even positive growth following stress. So uh, resilience is more of you can recover and grow after experiencing stress. Whereas hardiness is that you can handle a stressful situation and continue functioning during that situation. Our next topic to discuss is coping self-efficacy. And coping self-efficacy is the personal belief that you can successfully cope with a particular situation. So um, your evaluation of what we're encountering, our appraisal of a situation can depend on that specific situation, the demands that are being put on us. But if you're faced with a situation and your evaluation of it is, I can handle this, then you're going to have a more positive response to that stress because you feel confident in your ability to cope with that situation. So when you're evaluating a particular situation, um, if you've encountered this kind of situation before, um, if you have to give a talk to a bunch of peers, 
and you've given a talk before and it's gone well in the past, then you're going to increase that self-efficacy because I've done it before, I can absolutely do it again. We can also increase that feeling of efficacy by observing others. If you can see others doing the same task and they're doing it successfully, then you're going to feel more confident that you can do it too. If we experience social persuasion or encouragement, if you have a bunch of friends cheering you on, or if you have uh, an advisor telling you that you can do this, you're going to do fine, then maybe you're going to feel more confident in your abilities as well. And the last of these that helps is having low levels of arousal. Basically, if you don't get really worked up about the event, you're going to feel more confident that you can handle this. I'm not feeling worried, so I'm going to be fine. And having strong sense of self-efficacy, having that confidence that you can handle this situation, is also linked to an increase in immune fus uh, functioning. So if you are comfortable in your ability to do something, if you feel confident that you can get through this, your immune system usually ends up being higher functioning as well. Next, we can talk about optimism. And on the flip side, I suppose, we can talk about pessimism as well. So whether you have a positive or a negative view of the world. So people who are optimistic generally have a positive affect. And that's linked with better health and longer life overall. And a lot of this optimism relates to how we view or think of the future. And so these beliefs of how we think events are going to turn out can end up playing a really important role in how we handle stress, how we experience stress, and what we even consider stressful. So an optimist will look at the future and assume that things are going to work out. They have that positive outlook, things are probably going to be fine. Whereas a pessimist is going to have a more negative outlook. They're going to be a little bit more doom and gloom and assume that there's going to be a negative outcome. Because of this difference in how they view these outcomes, we end up seeing that pessimistic people have a pretty high risk of experiencing helplessness and depression when they're facing stressful events. If their natural tendency, if their natural belief is that it's not going to matter, nothing I do is going to help, everything's going to work out poorly, then their behavior is going to be to give up, to not bother trying, to feel just depressed about it, and to feel helpless. So optimists are going to feel less helpless, they're going to adjust better to these negative life events because they have that positive outlook, they're going to experience less helplessness, and Interestingly, again, this ties into health. Optimists tend to have better health. They tend to live longer. They tend to be happier. Um, and there's a whole bunch of research that's looked at this. But a couple of the highlights are the fact that um, the idea is that optimists have this view of the future and there being a future and that they should prepare for the future. And so optimists tend to engage in more preventative and proactive health measures, things like eating right and exercising because they want to be healthy in the future, whereas pessimists end up engaging in fewer of those proactive measures and end up having poorer health outcomes in the future. And so I'm sure you can imagine this is a much more complex issue and there's tons of research on it, but... Uh, just sort of one brief discussion to have about optimism and pessimism and might influence our health. Next, we're going to talk very briefly about personality, which seems to be a running trend throughout this part of the, well, actually the whole course. Um, but there's increasing evidence that your personality can make you more or less vulnerable to illness, such as heart disease or even cancer. Or at least there's a complex relationship between personality and potential illness. Um, but if we look at two broad types of personality, you might have heard of people talking about being type A or type B personality. So a type A personality who is, some, is going to be someone who is very competitive, highly ambitious, very driven. They can occasionally be viewed as aggressive and hostile because they want to do what they want to do when they want to do it. 
Um, people who are type A end up having sort of a constant sense of urgency. They're always aware of the time and they're always stressed about it. They can end up being irritable and impatient and, like we said, hostile. Type B personalities tend to be more relaxed and agreeable. They tend to be less worked up and they tend to have better health outcomes because of it. Or at least the association is there. Again, I'm trying not to give too much of our causality here. And the textbook spends a little bit more time talking about this, where it's not every aspect of being a type A personality predisposes you to illness and high levels of stress. Um, there are certain aspects that seem to have a stronger influence. Um, so, for example, people who have type A personalities also seem to have very negative emotions and negative interpretations, and that seems to be more strongly correlated with um, being highly stressed and experiencing some of the health problems that come with that. Um, but again, a really complex and interesting topic of discussion. And for the last slide of this chapter, we can talk about how people can try and find meaning in stressful life events. And one of the most interesting things that we can talk about for this is how spiritual beliefs can help people handle stressful situations. Um, and so having spiritual beliefs, having this idea of um, a larger picture or the greater good, um, it can actually give people more effective coping mechanisms. So people who have strong religious beliefs might find it comforting to know that they have someone watching out for them, that this is all part of a big plan when they're handling situations of crisis. It can be relaxing, calming. It can help them cope better with stressful situations if they can frame the situation according to their beliefs. But religious beliefs can have effects either way. So they can make it um, either... They can give you coping techniques, they can make it less stressful in a particular situation, or they can make it worse. Um, certain religious beliefs can end up having a negative effect on how you handle stress. So if people frame the situation as, I'm being punished, I uh, didn't follow the rules, um, uh, this is what I get for having gone off and doing my own thing, uh, if they start feeling guilty about it, it can end up having a negative effect on how they handle stress because they would view a stressful situation as something that they've deserved for their behavior. So instead of being comforted by their religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs, they might start feeling worse about it and that can lead to poor outcomes and poor coping with stress. Um, so lots of factors to consider. 